Hi everybody, I'm Trevor Marshall and Pierre Oliver joins me in the Train Masters TV studio. Pierre has been on our show a number of times over the past couple of years to talk about how to build resin freight car kits. And uh, we thought it would be a good time to actually look at some of the kits that Pierre's company, Yarmouth Model Works, produces. Uh, first of all, you're a relatively new manufacturer when we look at some of the companies that have been doing resin for, for decades now. How did you get started as a manufacturer? Uh, it sort of happened by accident. I met a fellow at uh, what was then the uh, Naperville RPM uh, named Aaron Yermanson, and he had a pattern for a Wabash stock car that I wanted for my own layout. It was spectacular. He did the pattern. He was capable of doing the casting, but he didn't have the time, the resources to do everything else, the marketing, the packaging, etc. So right there and then on that weekend, uh, we struck up a deal where he'd do the pattern work and the casting and I'd do everything else. Okay. And it sort of has exploded from there. Because you work with a number of pattern makers now yes. and people who supply uh, special items like, for instance, the photo etch artwork and then the photo etches themselves. Yep. And how long have you been doing that now? Uh, five, six years. Five, six years. And this year, you've had a whole bunch of kits coming out yeah. all at once. This is, a, this is sort of a banner or make or break year or I've lost my mind year. I've got, in preparation for the upcoming uh, Chicagoland RPM, I have four new HO scale kits and these two new S-scale boxcar kits, which are pretty much all sold out already. Where this particular car here, this uh, Atlantic Coastline 016B, I have a real affinity for rebuild cars okay. and a real affinity for automobile cars. You put the two of them together and you get something like this. This is a rather unique looking car with a unique panel arrangement and a ladder arrangement. If you note, there's a, a grab and a ladder and then another grab. Just the little details okay. here that make the difference. The other really interesting thing about this car for, for us from a manufacturing point of view is this pattern was completely developed in SolidWorks and then 3D printed. Okay. And from there it was cast. Okay. Uh, so it's not actually a 3D printed model that your customers receive. That is correct. But you've used the 3D print as the master yep. and then what, cleaned it up and prepared it for gas? We, we, we found a source for a really good high resolution printer, which reduces the amount of cleanup as necessary. Mm -hmm. I think we're doing something in the, it does something in the range of 16 microns per layer. Um, but uh, with where 3D printing is at, it is still not in the um, mass market level or large kit production because it's just too expensive because right. you're paying for time. But as a pattern source, it's fantastic. Which you're then spreading that cost over yeah. 50 kits or whatever. Y exactly. Um, and, and one of the points that I like to use to demonstrate the, the cost difference, is and so we'll come to the other, these guys here, my pride and joys, um, this American Car and Foundry proprietary roof uh, took a long time to develop working with Ed Hawkins and uh, Pat Wilder at the RP Psych publication. This print here, we had it commercially done as a master pattern and the resolution on this is really high. That print alone was over $200 just to get this roof part printed. Mm -hmm. It took two tries to get the artwork right. Uh, you have a photograph, I believe. Yes, there we go. This is the best photo I could find, period, of this roof. And this shows... It looks like a, an accident happened it, yeah, here. Nice yeah. derailment with a Rock Island car. Uh, but photos of this American Car and Foundry roof turned out to be really difficult to find. And oddly enough, this photo showed up. Uh, I think I found this on eBay. Um, right after we had done the print, and it proved that we'd gotten it right. Nice. So we've now putting it into a series of models. This is the first three of a series of American Car and Foundry post-war boxcars that we're going to be doing. Um, the I, I want to ask in particular about the green car because that's very unusual. We see a lot of boxcar red and yep. brown, but uh, what's the story behind the West India Fruit and Steamship Company? They had a small fleet of around 100 to 150 cars built for them by American Car and Foundry with this proprietary roof and what American Car and Foundry called their car builder end. Mm -hmm. Originally built in 51 or 52, 
But in the mid to late 50s, 56, 57, they went out and they re repainted the entire fleet in green with the yellow lettering. Okay. It's also interesting to note that... And this was between, they, they operated between Florida and, and Havana, Cuba, right? Yeah. Yeah. So when the revolution came, this company disappeared. Okay. A lot of these cars wound up going, I believe, to uh, Atlantic Coastline. There you go. And got repainted into, into Atlantic Coastline colors. Um, the interesting thing too is, is that the steamship that you see on the side of the car, the shape of the bow changed when they relettered the cars. The original white lettering on the red car, it's a kind of more vertical uh, okay. prow on, uh, on the car. These two cars, the ACL and the WIF, are both 12 panel welded cars. And as we're doing now with all of our welded panel cars, we've figured out how to replicate the oil canning, or the, uh, as it's called, or the, um, the ripples that you get in sheet steels from the heat buildup from welding it. Yeah, okay. So to if you get one of these kits and it looks wavy, that's it, on purpose. It's, yes, it's a feature, not an accident. Right. Whereas the, uh, the BAR car, of course, is a 10-panel riveted car, so we have a slightly different side, but the roof and the ends are the same. And this is a later uh, a 5758 paint scheme on the car. Originally as built, factory built, they were and factory painted, they had that uh, iconic red, white, and blue paint job. Mm. I just haven't been able to get the artwork together for the decals for those as yet, but um, I'm sure like yourself, I have a bit of a soft spot for that red, white, and blue um, paint job. I just live in, f I don't like doing it because yeah. it's a big job. Well, I, th this, uh, it's a striking car though, and certainly those large reporting marks on the side, there's no doubt about who, who owns, owns this car. car. Right. It, it would be nice on our model railways if all uh, prototypes had these uh, size lettering. I mean, imagine an operating session, you wouldn't need your reading glasses at all. You could see it from across the room. So, uh, anything else to talk about about that car, or do you want to get on to my favorite subject? Well, let's yes, go to your favorite. Well, the only other thing that I'm going to mention on the ACF cars is, is, is the next car, the fourth one in this series, will be the DTNI car, and it will use this uh, proprietary end from ACF. I don't know if the camera can pick up. There's, what makes this end significant is, is that there's a series of dimples down the corner edges here. Nobody else ever did this. I don't know why they did it, but it makes for an excellent spotting feature. There you go. Yeah. Um, and so between the, each rib there on the end, yes, so you can see and those little dimples. We're yep. going to be doing, a, as I say, the DTNI car first, and then there's going to be a series of other cars that will feature this end. Uh, I'm expecting all done 10 to 12 different cars. ACF cars by the time I'm done. Nice. But yes, now on to your personal favorite. My personal favorite, the S-Scale. For those who don't know, I model an S-Scale, although I am a bit of a rubber gauger. And uh, what's the story behind these? These are uh, obviously Canadian National 1937 AAR design boxcars. What makes these striking is the National Steel Car 2 end. Okay. Uh, this has never been done in S scale before. These ends were developed in, in, in SolidWorks and again 3D printed. And then we took a, a, a plastic uh, boxcar and cut it up and then affixed the ends to it. Uh, cleaned up all the underbody details, improved them. Uh, and if you're at all familiar with any of my kits, you'll note that I've got, there's photo etching here for various and sundry brake hangers and, and brackets, uh, sill steps. You know, so there's a full correct underbody detail here going on. Uh, oh, and laser cut running boards, of mm -hmm. course. And the other car with this flat panel roof, which is an earlier uh, built car, has a slightly different brake arrangement uh, with, the, with the air reservoir mounted, mounted transversely. So there's slightly different brackets available to do that compared to what's... And both variations come in... Both variations all come in the same kit. Yeah. The kit comes with all the uh, Maple Leaf Heralds. Mm -hmm. There's four? Something like that. Four different Heralds to choose from depending on the time frame in the era that you're modeling. Okay. This is your first foray into S-scale mm -hmm. as a manufacturer. How's that going for you? Well, I, I am not disappointed. These are almost completely sold out as of this date, but I think the demand is there, and I'm certainly now entertaining uh, another S-scale project. 
Excellent. Well, if you want to learn more about what Pierre is doing at Yarmouth Model Works, check out his website. And of course, if you want to see what Pierre and I have been talking about on Train Masters TV, it's on the Notch 8 programs. And there are about uh, almost a dozen videos now, I think, of the two of us going through how to build resin kits. Uh, be sure to check it out. Thank you.